Hello, hello. Hello. Hey, Leon. I, I just realized there's two people from um, the conference. Well, actually four. I forgot to hmm. give the URL for me. but I don't hear you. Do you hear me? I can hear you, yes. And I'm not muted. Okay, just one second. One second, I will be back. Yes, this is much better. Okay, oh, you can hear me typing. <laughs> that what happened. So where is everybody? Yeah, there were a few people at the conference who I forgot to give the URL to. I don't know who's, who's joining us today. I think Alan is coming. Let me just check. Okay. Um, did was, you... asked, was, El... yeah? oh, Sorry. No. was Ellen at the conference? No. Oh. No, the only person at the conference from this community was Mark Anderson. Okay. So okay. the work you've done with um, looking at visual meta and uh, VR is, of course, well, rather 3D is really, really fascinating. Um, I came up with a very strange bump in the road. Uh, yesterday, I tried to take the future, excuse me, the hypertext conference proceedings, which is now one document, all of the articles, which is great. I tried to make it visual meta, but it turns out the ligatures, you know, when the F, F comes together and stuff like that, when they touch, broke the whole yeah. thing. So we need to think about that. Oh, really? I just thought that was a very stupid little detail. But anyway, let's not talk about Peter. But oh, there he is. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Good morning. Brunching with mom. Very good. Very so, good. how was the conference? Well, yeah, it was it, it was good. Yes, absolutely. But a lot of things. First of all, it's very hot in Rome. You know, thirty-two degrees plus sun. Oh, uh, wow! So we found a few times to sit in uh, in the shade. The the garden area was great. The evenings were really, really lovely. There was always a group of us who was out till we literally got kicked out. They turned the lights off and moved the table away. That happened almost every night. So that was good. Uh, a lot of the presentations I find completely irrelevant to our work. 
Uh, there are so many directions that um, hypertext is being pulled in, and I think that's absolutely fine. We need that wider dialogue. And one thing that surprised me towards the end, some kind of a planning meeting, uh, we talked about, um, well, they talked about, oh, we should have more developers, so they should maybe have a prize for the best developer or something. And they were thinking of a name because they like to name these prizes after people. It has to be someone that's ACM supports and stuff. So I suggested uh, Licklider. Oh, great idea. No one had heard of him. Oh, my God. No way. That's horrific. That is causing me mental anguish, yes. Don't they have the kids look at the literature anymore? I, I don't know. I don't know. But other than that one little what in the world, yeah, it was good. And, you know, I, I, I showed you this thing, right? Just, just the globe you touch on it, and it moves in 3D between, right? So here's another one that I also used for my presentation to kind of remind people how advanced our little gadgets are. This is the world, right? But it's actually night and day, 3D. I could spin it around Amazing. on a wristwatch, on a normal, this is not the ultra or anything, on a normal Apple watch. So that was a little bit of a, can't we just move beyond the ideas of hypertext that are 30 years old? Or even, can we even implement them? And, and what happened next? Did you get angry? <laughs> well, I, I did a presentation that was uh, very much exalting and screaming at people. Uh, saying, you know, we need to think about VR. VR may or may not be good for text, but we, we, we owe it to ourselves to find out. But that was only kind of in a pre-session and what they call a workshop. So not everyone saw that. But there was one other thing. Hang on a second. So uh, as you know very well, Leon, um, I think you might know, Peter, we went, uh, my family and I, on a holiday as part of this. First, we went to Malta. And we flew over to Sicily, where we had a few nice days. We went to Syracuse, the original Syracuse. And uh, Sicily is, of course, a volcanic island. Mount Etna is there. We went there, too. And then I bought this in Syracuse. It's ah, the Shard of Obsidian. Absolutely Obsidian. Local from there. But what was really shocking was how it fits in my hand. It's really nice to touch, you know, it's got the right kind of tackiness, but also if you see the kind of um, the shape of it, right, it's, this hasn't been made into a tool, it's just random stuff to sell to idiot tourists like myself. But still, the it, it seems like the crystalline kind of curves just fits the human hand really well. Of course, it was kind of used. So I did a little bit of research and it turns out that humans have been using obsidian for millions literally millions of years before we became human so that was a bit of a wow so i showed that as part of my presentation and said we'll only be using our fingers on vr or we'll be using pens and maybe even something like obsidian and that was fun and, and what did, what did you mean by used by humans or pre-humans before we were humans yeah, I think Homo habilis um, used it. Obsidian's been used for a very long time. So it's a very good product name for the uh, Obsidian kind of knowledge system. So that was that was kind of cool. Um, did you both get an email from me with the draft invitation for um, kind of the final sending out for the symposium? Yes. I haven't checked my mail today. Oh, okay. Um, so, Leon, you're coming, which is fantastic. I now have to um, size I'll up. I'll be remote for obvious reasons. Yeah, you have one thing that's an issue, though. Look at this line here, Peter. So, um, East Coast, 4 a.m. till noon. No, that can't be 4 a.m. Yeah, 4 a.m. till noon. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll have to sleep during the day the night before. Uh, it's a bit awful. But there may be someone in Asia who can join us this time. And um, I'm spreadsheeting here. It's coming or not. So, okay. So let's just do a few of these while we're here, actually. 
1.0, no, no, not 1.0 person. Let's change that to 500%. Yeah, most likely she's not presenting. Leon, you're going to be there. Be there, you're a zero there, unfortunately, when you're one here. I think Fabian is coming, pretty sure. Gabriel is coming. Uh, he's a developer whom I met in the Arctis conference. So these are the people I will be sending out specific invitations today, including our network. And these are some of the more recent people who um, we got in touch with to invite. Nice, it's happening. What's that? It's happening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's happening. It's uh, exciting. But I wonder where everybody is today. But I know Mark Anderson cannot make it. He has uh, his current work project is in here. But uh, I think Alan. Yeah, I don't know. It. But um, yeah, not too much other than that to report specifically from the conference. But I'd very much like to hear how you guys are doing and how your summer was. Now, Peter, do you want to go ahead? Uh, fighting the jungle in the garden. Otherwise, plugging along on, well, right now I'm doing a background research project for the World's Fair people. And I'm like 71 typeset pages in. I just keep finding new material, and I desperately want to make sure I don't leave anything important out. Uh, tell us more about the World's Fair people, please. Uh, well, basically, um, Cameron Weesey, out, I think he's currently in San Francisco now, uh, is trying to organize a new World's Fair uh, that will be cited somewhere in the U.S. at some point in the next few years looking forward. So we're trying to plot out all of the different issues and considerations that we'll have to take into account and doing a lot of deep diving into the history of past world's fairs, which is really, really fascinating reading and research. Huh. What would be the point of the world's fair? That's uh, obviously it's a good idea. I'd just like to hear your, your perspective on that. Well, recent world's fairs have turned into nation branding exercises and they haven't had any kind of a consistent theme or message anymore. And they also, because of that nation branding focus, have certainly fallen short of the level of technology exposure that you had with the Great Exhibition. Um, yeah, way back when. So we'd like to get back to having more than just megacorps represented and also present a view of a future that people would want to live in and give them the sense that the decisions that you're making today are going to be shaping what that future is going to be. Because everything has gotten so obsessed with gloom and doom, pessimism, dystopian futures, and all the science fiction movies that we're almost getting to the point where a lot of people just sort of waiting for someone to put our civilization out of its misery. And um, if you looked at Kenneth Clark's civilization book, um, back when Rome was starting to fall, people started losing faith that the future could be any better. And then they actually started to almost look forward to the barbarians coming in and taking over because they just wouldn't have to wait, anticipating the horror of the barbarians coming in and taking over anymore. Talking of uh, the Romans, so I was in Rome, obviously, and uh, one of the most amazing things was um, I went to the Roman Forum three times, first with uh, family, second with colleagues, and then third time on my own. Third time, it was amazing. The um, Curia, where the Senate met, was open. I could walk inside it, sit down, and relax. Oh, that, phone. That, that, it was almost even though the Romans did horrible things and I don't venerate them to any degree that was almost a religious experience that was uh, amazing so thanks for bringing up the Romans and, and, and that situation well Peter's gone uh, thumbs up but with silence for the um, morning. I'm just going to check a message here. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm really curious about this uh, pessimism because maybe it's some kind of a ping pong effect that, uh, uh, like, as you get older, things start to look more dystopian because you see, you know, like, for example, when I uh, was young and I watched Star Trek Next Generation, I was pretty, pretty optimistic uh, about uh, where it could all go. And then if, but if, if I would read the newspaper all day about big tech and all kinds of scandals, then that would have the opposite effect. So I find this uh, dystopian slash versus optimism a very complex uh, uh, thing. I, I yeah, it, it's it's very, it's very complex to to know. Yeah, yeah, is it good or bad? Yeah, it's ooh, it's not easy. There are many many reasons to be concerned about the future. Many reasons to be uh, happy about the future. Uh, you know, many things happening. I do have to say though that um, it's an interesting question, as long as it doesn't go into climate change denial. Because that is just one thing that's got to be fixed or dealt with. Outside of that, I think uh, many, many discussions. Okay, sorry about that. Just a telephone call coming in in an opportune moment, as they always do. The what? It was just a telephone call coming in in an opportune moment, as they always do. Oh, is that? Oh, sorry. I just, yeah. No, no, no that's, that's fine, of course. Yeah, we. Uh, I don't know how much you heard of uh, our comment on what you said there. Uh, yeah, I caught it. I was half listening, phone in one ear, um, open yeah. ear to the mic on the other. Yeah, that's fine. Um, hang on, Adam Byrne is texting or something. Yeah, so with all the dystopian movies, people sort of get the feeling there's no hope. We're just sort of like on a railroad track going into one preordained future and there's nothing that can be done about it and hopefully the world's fair can spark people's imaginations again um another interesting thing is all of the ties between disney and the world's fair uh, for instance disney's father had worked on the 39 fair and of course disney prepared for pavilions for his new york fair um so there are a lot of cross ties between disney and the fairs and basically, when Epcot Center opened, that killed World's Fairs in the United States because everybody feared, well, Epcot Center is going to be the permanent World's Fair. So why have a World's Fair somewhere else when you go to future World of Disney? Um, but they made a few design flaws, um, one of which was, of course, the massive sinkholes that are underneath the Epcot site. So that really constrained what they were able to do in future building. Um, there are unconfirmed reports that the Horizons Pavilion had to be demolished because a sinkhole was starting to open up under one corner of it. Um, and no one will confirm that one way or the other, but that's sort of the general feeling of the community of people who follow such things. Um, the pavilions themselves were accused of having become dated. But if you look at the actual design of the storytelling within the pavilions, about three quarters or so of it, maybe almost as much as 80%, was devoted to historical vignettes that wouldn't change. So you had a huge timeless portion of the pavilion, and then only in the last quarter of the ride or so would you start seeing projections of the future. So those certainly could have been refreshed and updated to keep the things going longer. But you know, Disney corporate headquarters wanted to start pushing in more intellectual property to drive sales of the movies and related IP areas. So they totally obliterated the original sense of Epcot as being a place for educational content and started turning it into a park that would appeal more to younger and younger audiences, uh, which drove out what high tech elements there were, causing it to lose appeal to older audiences. And you know, in the early golden days, when I first went, everything was very optimistic and future looking. And it really inspired you to want to go out and become a part of making that big, bright future. And once they started phasing that out, the park completely lost its direction. It certainly lost appeal because the internet came along and you were able to see that just a couple of Google searches were revealing way more useful and interesting educational substance matter than you'd find in any pavilion on an Epcot visit. So that's sad to hear. Bad management decisions just utterly destroy that. So now 
because Future World, they've dropped the Future World brand completely, turned it into the different little neighborhoods in the area that used to be Future World. There's nothing out there in the U.S. by way of a park that'd be the equivalent of the Museum of Tomorrow or the Museum of the Future that we have in other countries. Um, all of the most exciting architecture at fairs is happening in the Middle East or China, which has the most infinite money to pour into cool new building sites. So there's this sense of a malaise in the U.S. pop culture. And with all of the dystopian movies coming out, there's nothing to really engage young kids and get them to feel, gee, I want to become a part of science and technology because I can really make the world dramatically better. Instead, the feeling is, well, I'm doomed. I'm going to be fried by the climate. The politicians are all crooked and there's absolutely nothing I can do to have any impact on anything in the future. So we're hoping that a new fair could you know, jumpstart that sense of wonder and excitement and promise and maybe shift the thinking of young people back onto a science STEM track and into feeling empowered about their ability to change the future. There isn't just one future. There are a whole bunch of possible futures out there. And the decisions that we're making today are going to affect which path we vector onto. Yeah, I, I think that sounds uh, really useful. Uh, and so there's a huge community of people that, that's developed online who are trying to preserve memories of Epcot's early days. As wonderful said, the original Epcot, because Disney had planned to build an actual city before he died. And he wanted to do um, basically a central hotel tower in the middle, surrounded by high density housing and an office park in a subsidiary area. And it really would have been an attempt to rethink urban planning based upon everything that he could get his hands on to read at the time. Yeah. But as soon as he was gone, the company wanted to move on to less expensive things that would generate more immediate profit and return for the shareholders. Yeah. Uh, I see uh, Alan has entered the building. Hi, Alan. We've been talking about dystopian futures and how to try to kick ourselves in the pants to get away from them. Hey, all. I'm all about that. That's great. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, um, oh, you're in a new spot. Yes. You're in a reading nook, it looks like. This is my reading nook. It's the other part of the room that uh, doesn't get much uh, visibility, but... Yep. Good lamp. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, just to ask you guys, first of all, have you had a chance to briefly see the email I sent as a draft for the uh, invitation? It's an invitation partly to uh, the, the new people whom I met, some of whom I met at Hypertext, but just want to make sure uh, you don't need to proofread it or anything that it reflects uh, your values of how to present this thing. I have not read it. Could you resend it to me, Frode? I think it might have gotten brought it into the bit bucket by accident. I'm showing my last note from you being September 2nd, so. Yeah, I can do. Did, did uh, that one arrive? Uh, checking my inbox now. Checking mail. Then we could talk about actual things. And mail seems to be in limbo, saying that it's checking mail with nothing happening. Okay, well, that's not a problem. I'll paste it into our Zoom chat as well. The key thing is uh, that just a tiny bit of text where I say what we're doing.
too long. Okay, so look at sections then. Uh, we're supposed to comment on the the email text itself. Is that what you're asking? What, what, yeah, and to, just to tell me if you feel it's something that you're happy that I send out on our behalf, or um, something drastically wrong, specifically you, because we're talking about reams of paper and stuff. So you got a reams uh, I, of paper I, reference. I like the the gist of it. Yeah, the. I mean, I, I think everything's fine. The The postscript seems a little like uh, ad hoc, uh, like thrown in there, but, uh, you know, yeah, whatever, I don't. It, it, it is a bit ad hoc. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be there. If it was just meant as kind of a, a little bit while we're doing it. But for now, I will remove it. Yeah, length matters. Long emails get read less. I'm sure there's a power law or something. Yeah. Maybe my iCloud might be full. Let me delete a little junk mail, then maybe it'll come in. Oh, so much junk mail. Uh, Peter, it's also in the chat, this text. Ah, there it is. Okay, I see it in the chat. Okay, that would be easier way. I'll worry about declogging like cloud later on then. All right, reading it now in the chat. So the 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 theme is extending text, extending thought. That's what I think it should be, yes. But that's, um, well, that, that's my current way of wording it. Doesn't mean we have agreed on that. Okay. I.e., to be discussed. Gotcha. Yeah, I think it's good. It's good. Okay, that's all. We don't need like to it. we don't need to spend sessions and sessions on it. Okay, so I'll send that out starting tonight and tomorrow. Um, the timings, not that you should go and redo everything, but does it look correct? Does it look like I've made an obvious error? Because I'm very good at those particular errors. You mean what you said? The timings? Yeah. Future text on the fourth of October, uh, nine. I would I would say nine to five, nine a.m. to five p.m. and then the time zone. So in the introduction sentence, fourth of October brackets nine to five UK time. Yeah, because I I actually read that in part because it's on the second line as October 9th. <laughs> I, I was like, wait. <laughs> Nine through five. What does that mean? So it's going or backwards should, in time. <laughs> or, exactly. Or should I just delete extending it? time text and thought? Yes. What's that? Should I maybe delete the nine to five after the fourth of October since I have a timings thread further down? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually thought the same thing first of October 9th for a split second. Yep. Was the it's October funny how it after it grabbed my eye first? Cool. By the way, I just wanted to show you guys something. Um, you know, some people twiddle with Lego and other things when they talk. This is what I'm doing right now when I'm talking to you guys. These are the pictures from last week at the hypertext and you know of course we all know about all kinds of um, uh, ai tools but just this thing in in lightroom you see pretty high quality pictures because of the um the like of it 
look at this amazing thing. Just select the background. Okay, fine, instant. Lower the contrast just a touch the background so that they stick out a little bit. Like wow. It's insane, oh, right? Very cool. That's really wild. And that's, that's it. Wild. So, so now I copy that, the, uh, copy the settings, and then we go to the next picture. And then I paste the settings and it pastes not my mask, because that would be useless. Try that again. It pastes the uh, command to find the subject and to do this. Did I do it correctly? Okay. Copy. Hang on. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It keeps unselecting that because it's a bit insensitive. So now I do it here and I'll just do it. AI that's useful. And then wow. you know, clean it up a bit. So I decided to go with the uh, monochrom for all the pictures from the event because um, there's so much bad lighting in terms of colors for academic places. So mm. people look all kinds. Yeah, of... this looks great. So that's that. I'll, I'll post it when I'm done. But um, right. So. Um, as a kind of a trip report from hypertext, it really highlighted again, as they always do, the importance of being there. So yeah. Leon is coming here to the future of text, and you should both consider coming when you can some year or some event. Yeah. Because you know what we have in these two hour sessions can often be as good as anything that happens at a proper conference. You know, often we waste time, but yeah. often it can be amazing, right? Uh, but sitting outside, arguing with people about all kinds of things, especially generally our subject matter, and the, until the restaurant says, okay, you must go, it's amazing. That's fantastic. But the specific things, yeah, it's the past brought up again, old hypertext ideas, uh, some new students now, which is great coming into the community, but um, there wasn't anything like a specific new way of looking at hypertext, but there was a paper by Dave Millard and Mark Anderson called Seven Hypertext, which is their way of trying to categorize hypertext, not as a definitive, but as a talking point. And I thought that was very worthwhile because, of course, there will never be a one ontology for any type of text. But by making them, we have something to argue around, which is the reason I know it sounds I know it sounds tangential. I like religion because you have this text to argue around. You may not agree, you know, like the Jewish um, scholars or forget the right language. You know, you have to have a certain amount of people and you talk about it and talk in a specific way. It's fantastic. Imagine if we had a similar discipline to kind of academic reading. I think that'd be very, very useful. Anyway, yeah, that's good. So Peter and Alan, there are cheap flights. I I would it. I didn't hear that one. I said I would be all about it uh, if um, life circumstances permit. Oh, Rob is joining us. My goodness. Oh, sorry. My no, bad. Don't, don't be sorry. Just uh, <laughs> very happy you are here. Uh, we're going through a very slow chit chat about general things and a bit of a review of hypertext. And very happy to uh, introduce you to the guys who are here. Uh, Rob is and was and has always been an artist, a uh, hypertext artist nonetheless. And um, he wrote a book and made a an interactive experience called Portal back when uh, back when the Mac was young. And Rob, it's probably better if you introduce yourself than me completely making a mess of things. Can I see who's there? Yes, um, you should be able to on the screen, but it's uh, Leon, Alan, Peter. Mark Anderson is not here today. He has work obligations. Uh, so they're a oh. tiny group, tiny but nice group, talking a little bit about the some, uh, conference there we and so on. Okay. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm late. I completely forgot. I got hungry and went next door for food. And Thanks for joining us. I still have dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, you're, you're in, okay. uh, in Silicon Valley, right? I live in I live in Silicon Valley. I have for the last fifty years. And um, what can I say? I write mostly novels. Uh, I've written books about archaeology. I worked as a time at a place called the Institute for the Future, doing scenarios about the future. And uh, I worked as a technical writer at Apple in the 80s and did a, I scripted a couple of games and then I got to do my own game called Portal. And that's why I was at Hypertext because it's uh, uh, a revenant. It's being reanimated uh, <laughs> by the, the, the uh, Dr. Dini Frankenstein. <laughs> that's a great name for Dini, yes. <laughs> and uh yeah that's that's it i'm uh i'm long retired from teaching so i forget well, about it uh rob I'm alan a pleasure to meet you i would love I, to ask you some questions actually or, or um yeah get your take on some some thoughts uh that you i'm, I'm sure you've thought about probably more thoroughly than i have uh well, on that but sort of scenarios, sort of kind of what we do here at times is like, you know, thought almost thought experiments and they kind of become their own shagoths or whatever. Um, yes. Unless there's something else to to dig into, Frode, do we have an agenda to get through? I think that's the agenda. All right. Well, this is a, we'll see how it goes up. Um, this is something from what I was working on yesterday, uh, and this isn't the this isn't the scroll space project. This is just um, I'll try and frame up the the part of the future of text that I'm interested in, and I think the group is interested in may fall along these lines. I was, uh, uh, you know, it's a lazy Sunday. I'm getting some links together. I'm reading some various articles and then I start writing and, and it pulls in those, those influences from the last three days, right? This is a typical thing we all go through. And I find that what I want is, uh, I'm always, I want, I want to shape these associations. I want to give them a shape. An article is a pretty standard shape that these things could take, right? It's pretty free, free flowing. A collection or a list is another kind of shape, but none of those seem to satisfy me. They aren't distinct enough. They don't capture how they flow, how these links and ideas kind of flow in and out of each other, right? More recently, there might be a graph that I could do, but that doesn't seem to uh, uh, capture it either. Uh, I wonder if like morphology of uh, anthills or something like that would be uh, closer to it but that also, the minute you do that, that pins down the the links as if they're like commodities, right? Um, it's it's an interesting relationship we have with these artifacts of knowledge now that we can collect them easily, but we can't easily figure out how to, you know, synthesize them or 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 sculpt them. Yeah. Uh, I I have a uh, a response to that. Um, when I was at the Institute for the Future, we were collecting a lot of data and I invented a little process where I would write a very short, I call them vignettes, but it would kind of encapsulate the, uh, the, the, the learnings, the, uh, what was extracted from the information in a, in a story form. I'm a fiction writer, so I write mm -hmm. stories. And the last book I did is called Mixed Harvest. And it's a collection of stories about prehistory, all based on data. So yeah, how do you pull that stuff together in, in a compelling narrative? I think narrative is a really powerful way to do it. I do something similar myself. I, I kind of, uh, yeah, let let the images associate and, and uh, it, it's, it's a good tool uh, that way, but it, it only works if you have the time to, you know, say like, I'm going to sit down and figure, you know, get the stuff out of my head. Um, 
So, so vignettes is a good way to go. It'd be, it'd be interesting if there's ever going to be, um, an easier way to scan this stuff to, to find that vignette again, I guess, or not that vignette, but the ideas that are latent in it. Yeah. Well, you find the ideas and they begin to suggest, uh, a story. How do, how does, how do you start a story that leads you into the conclusions that the data gives you? And that means finding a character to represent the search. Could be autobiographical, I guess. That's interesting. Yeah, I have, I have examples, but not with me. I'm in a hotel. I look forward I to reading it. the book. Yeah, there. Um, oh, go ahead. No, somebody was. Yeah, I find that TV tropes is an invaluable resource. Lots of times I'll just go through that, following links back and forth, and I'll help to give ideas. Yeah. Well, you yeah, have to let them bounce track. around. Of course, it can be a huge time sink once you start warming your way through that massive wiki. Well. Not if you're a fiction writer. <laughs> there, there's no such thing as a time sink. Yeah. It's it's all fun to do. Could you tell us a little about Portal? I never got a chance to play that. Um Portal is a story about the about a uh, uh an indefinite future. Um uh, when most uh, major world problems are solved and uh, you have a kind of um, suffocating um, paradise that drives someone to want something more. Keep Interesting. <laughs> Intrigued, okay. Talking of wanting more, give us more. <laughs> Uh, ju just uh, sorry before you do that, Rob. Uh, yep. Fabian, just wanted to introduce uh, Rob. He is a digital artist and writer. I met him in the Hypertext Conference, and he's um, joining us here today. He's done some really brilliant work. Up, um, actually, hang on. Uh, will you explain to Alan? I'm just going to find a link uh, on you, Rob. Please go. Uh, ahead. Yeah. Well. Okay, the, the origin of the, of the project was in the very early days of computers, personal computers, not mainframes. I started thinking about them because I had one pre-Apple computer uh, as a kind of uh, storytelling platform because there's a screen through which you can push narrative. And in fact, most of what's on the other side of the screen is narrative, even if it's a spreadsheet or a, uh, certainly if it's a word processing document. But when we started doing the project, I said there were basically three things you use a computer for, and word processing is not very interesting because that's the same as a typewriter. No, it isn't. And, and I know, but for purposes of my argument, <laughs> uh, and I couldn't figure out how to do spreadsheet wars. So I thought a database was an interesting way to build up uh, a narrative out of small units. So the so the story is is uh, the the user in those days, usually they were teenage boys. Uh, so the hero of the story is a teenage boy. Um, the conceit is that you've uh, you've returned from a trip into into space, a one hundred year journey and cryosleep and you return to earth instead of the destination you were supposed to end up at and you uh discover that the earth is um basically completely depopulated uh, and being uh, everything's being reclaimed by nature animals and plants and the uh there's a, a barely functioning terminal which is the way i thought of early computers they weren't even terminals then. But for the sake of the conceit, 
it's a barely functioning terminal and you gradually start to access databases, one of which is an artificial intelligence storytelling AI named Homer. And together you and Homer try to piece together what happened to all the people and possibly figure out a way to get them back. So that was the conceit and uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And now it's got a new life, so. <laughs> it was amazing to see it, but it was also amazing with all these old computers, all these, you know, Macs with a nine inch screen, black and white, no gray, obviously. Well, no, it was a bit gray in the beginning, but it, it took me back to just a more pristine age um, as well. And I'm just wondering now, just in this saying the sentence, if we now look at our headsets in the same way, you know, I, I, the first time I saw a first Mac, I loved it. It was amazing, but it was very constrained what it was, what it would do. And, you know, the display is probably the same size as <laughs> the Quest display, roughly. So maybe we're romanticizing it in, in that sense, although we keep looking into the future. And there's a big yellow hand. Fabian, please. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, so for the anecdote, I'm, uh, I'm late because uh, my quote-unquote excuse is I was playing. So I was playing video game. Uh, I'm, I'm playing Baldur's Gate. Uh, it's not futuristic, it's fantasy. You fight uh, dragons and mages and warlords and whatnot. Uh, but, well, it's a lot of fun to the point that sometimes I I don't even know the, that the clock exists anymore. Um, but um, I, I think we are, first I recommend it, the game itself, uh, and then playing in general. Like I, I don't think it's a kid's activity. I think everybody should play. Uh, not everything is good though. And like when I see people in the in the subway or in public transport playing with like their phone on completely ridiculous stuff that just blinks in every direction to keep their attention so that they just like mindlessly like to me that's not playing. Uh, but here I was I was an adventurer slaying dragons. It's it's completely different, um, even though it's like still through a screen. And why do I mention all this? Uh, is because it's it's that game specifically, Baldur's Gate. Like I, you need at least a hundred hours of gameplay to finish it, and it's an entire story. And apparently, uh, I read there were like twelve thousand different endings. Um, so you have like so many decisions on how you build your characters. Are you righteous? Are you quote unquote evil? Do you save people, etc.? And it, it made me think yeah, about like branching narratives and the, the whole interaction behind it. I try not to think too much about it while I'm playing, but when the game is, when I'm doing something else, then I can think about how it's done, basically. And I, I'm quite excited by, it's just behind the screen. It's not in VR. But when I can see how, how the headset starts to get to work properly uh, and with narratives in worlds that are like, it's gigantic, like the, the depth, uh, not just how big the world is, but the depth of like every personage you interact with and who you start to become. Uh, when we'll have not just little games, like let's say Half-Life Alex, that are still beautiful in the headset, you have a lot of interaction, but it's still very, um, how can I say it? Like you have one path, basically. It, you're very guided. But if you have something open world with such breadth and depth, and in a headset, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. That's going to be kind of crazy because the, the time you need to put in, uh, but I think it's pretty exciting. Again, when the, the game itself, well, everybody has different preferences, but it's uh, you, you are someone and you do things like you, you, it has meaning on how you evolve in the game uh, and you have puzzle to solve and action, a bit of everything. It's, it's an art, it's beautiful. So I, I, I can't wait to see the intersection of all this. What you're describing, it's what's happened in the last 35 or 40 years. Um, since the primitive computer appeared, it seemed like a story that worked as if the com primitive computer were part of the story. Now you have, as you say, dragons and 
warlords and uh, all kinds of fantasies and the semiotics and the and the discourse the uh the 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 grammar of playing games is is very different my daughter's becoming an expert in this and i can barely follow her um but she gives presentations about game rhetoric and game narrative so a lot's happened since since portal but uh i, I tried to make portal something that would kind of introduce the computer as as a doorway into something different. Uh, blending those two, do, and maybe you know, maybe y'all know about something like this, but I still would love or look for a game that uh, is in and of itself more of a void. It is nothing, and it, it would it, you could define it as almost like a place to make vignettes, right? Where I could add in my links from the day or the thoughts from the day, and within this game format i could uh, either uh, 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 trivially or 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 going towards uh feeling catty or or arbitrary associate things together and kind of keep track of my you know thoughts over time or ideas but like i'd love a mix between what we consider to be what's in text or in documents or you know apps mixed with what we do in games um i haven't i have some idea in my mind i have some ideas of how that would seem very simple but i don't know if that's been tried and failed or or what you can you can play library angel okay uh a friend, a friend of mine described to me what the library angel is the, the good thing about libraries is there's lots of books there and they can uh, distract you from your single-minded purpose and introduce you to things that you might not have thought of. And sometimes they're very serendipitous and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you come up with something original that you wouldn't have come up with uh, if you'd plotted straight ahead. You're, you're, you're making me think that you could take a series of links and organize them into a story Mm -hmm. how you how you think that story might unfold select little bits from it uh because probably the whole wikipedia page isn't going to be part of a story but you know you can assemble them so that they make a coherent narrative you may then have to tweak it so that it's the same characters or the same people or the same theme all the way through but i could i could see uh, somehow uh, having stuff thrown at you that uh, you didn't expect. Yeah. yeah, like going through a thrift store or something or a yeah. garage sale and finding little bits that stand out to you and like, oh yeah, it's it's all about that serendipity, right? So the future text is a thrift store. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> there could be worse. I see, um, sorry, I, I see Leon has his hand up, but on, on this, uh, when you're talking about gaming and, and knowledge obviously one of the things is gamification which is you know whatever but it, it, even um probably in without the rich stories and the richness just the um care game designers take to the different tools you know like i've said before two different rifles feel different yet when you're in microsoft word two different typefaces feel the same you know it, it's mm. a stupid example but th there are things of elegance and design that with resources can be put in there um, leon please that's yeah that is indeed indeed amazing i was uh, i just wanted to touch on one thing when uh, at some point we were talking about uh games and the compute the role of the computer and i was realizing that actually sometimes the computer can gamify things which are not even intended as a game but they just like trigger it as an example, uh, when I was younger, I was really interested in computers, and, and but I, I didn't understand it. And I my, my English was also not that good. So I came up with a sort of game, uh, sort of to imagine that I was uh, logging into a space station and, and that I was learning uh, commands, you know, how to uh, list files, how to... Uh, log into to another computer, these things. 
I kind of like started to create a story around it. So there was a very interesting uh, uh, sort of loop between me and the computer that I was sort of imagining this game. And at the same time, I was learning or yeah, the, with the computer. And it was actually, I was not running a game, but I was just, I don't know. I was sort of playing a game without playing a game. It was, it was very mm -hmm. interesting uh, if I think about it. Like yeah. an open world uh, simulation. I think that's super cool. Uh, speaking of typefaces, I'm sorry to change the subject because I wanted to go back to the to the gamification of of learning about computers. But uh, when I published the book version of Portal, the publisher offered to hook me up with a typesetter in Oregon, oddly enough, who gave it, who, and we printed all the different databases in Portal in a different typeface. And every typeface to him had a different personality. So actually typefaces do have a, a subtle effect and you know, it's uh, obviously- they have, they have strong personalities, the typefaces, absolutely. But the act of typing them don't. Imagine, oh, no, no. That, imagine if you're typing like uh, one of those, the, the literal typeface typewriter and your keyboard will start making click noises. Right? I'm being ridiculous here on purpose. I'm just saying that the subtlety and the richness of using something should feel different. That, 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 that's all. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Sorry, Rob. I, 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 they did make noises when I type. I, I would like I would like typewriter clicks when I'm typing. It sets but, but, but different sounds for different typefaces. And imagine, uh, for instance, some of us who were in, no, none of us here. Oh yeah, you and me, right? We were in Rome just now. Imagine when we went to the, the Trajan column where the font Trajan comes from. And then you type with the font Trajan and it makes almost chisel noises, right? Why not? Why not? <laughs> uh, hmm. please. Tell that to Microsoft. No. <laughs> or Apple. No. <laughs> so, um, yeah. oh, I'd love a, it. A, a quick comment, like in two, three weeks, I guess, I'm giving a, a workshop to uh, kids in a, in difficult schools here in Brussels, and I was thinking, um, like a lot of them, even though I, I use VR as a way to teach them about computer literacy, uh, basically the, my goal then during the, the kind of sh one hour short workshop is for them to for them to think, oh, a computer is something I can program. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's something that I don't have to just like let's say. It triggered me a bit when you say, uh, ask Microsoft. No, don't ask anybody. Do it yourself. I'm not saying it's easy. You might ask a developer to do it. But basically, if you want to change something in your computer, like the thing that stands on your desk, it should be yours to do. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. That's that's kind of what I want to convey to the kids. Again, without any implication that, yeah, in five minutes, the crazy idea you had, you're going to make it. So that's kind of my goal. Um, to, to inspire them that yeah if you if you study hard at school uh, if you listen to what the teacher is saying in in math class or wherever you can eventually if you dedicate yourself change your computer to make whatever you can think of all this to say my my recent um, idea there was to use gaming for that uh, and because I want I thought I want them to get empowered let's say I was thinking of letting them design their own game. But I, when, when I heard the discussion, I thought most people I know, they just want to play. Um, and including, for example, me today, I spent more time playing than programming. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe I'm drifting away and maybe I shouldn't teach them how to make a game, but rather uh, enjoying a, a game and maybe explaining a little bit um, how it works. And if they want to modify a small thing, then through code, they can change it. I don't know, becoming bigger or throwing bigger boxes. I don't even know what the game will be uh, in VR. But uh, but yeah, I was starting to think most people are just game consumers or just players. They don't necessarily want to make their own game. And I'm wondering if that's the same for, yeah, if, if I don't ask too much to kids, if I ask them to design or modify a game. Uh, you don't mean program, but yeah. You well, mean, you mean control. I I want them to see that indeed, if if they can 
program, like change words that are not just English, but that look a bit, let's say, like magical spell, uh, then the whole behavior of the program, the computer program, which can be a game, a fun one, even a though in simple one, that's programming, basically. Right. So that, that's like the, the click, that's the little thing that I hope they'll do the, the aha moment, basically. So you have uh, one Californian on, in this call. And the, the thing, uh, you know, I love California, the weather there, the people there, it's amazing. But very often we get into discussions that basically come down to if people were just more like me, and I think I know you well enough, Fabian, to fight you on this point out of respect. Not everybody is that kind of inclined. I mean, you know, I, I talk about my son a lot. He's six now, and I can already see him and the other kids diverge a little bit about what they're good at. There are some math quizzes already, and some more logical, some more painterly, right? So I'm very happy that you push towards programming, but just in the community, let's be mindful that there are many ways to issue control. And it isn't necessarily from any one of the specific ways. But of course, it all goes back to the Ted Nelson thing. We should not be only passive consumers of computer stuff. We should take charge politically, artistically, programmatically, structurally, et cetera, and so on. And I'll shush Alan. Thank, thanks, by the way, Fabian, for the thumb. Uh, yeah, that just reminded me of... Oh, oh, oh yeah. Sorry, sorry. Rob is right. He didn't press the, the yellow hand button. Is it okay? Oh, I, I don't know where it is. I'm on a Mac uh, iPod, iPad. Oh, don't mini. worry. Don't worry. It's somewhere in here. No, I just wanted to say I'm really intrigued by the idea of putting sounds in with uh, key clicks. And if there were a chisel sound... I wonder what the impact on your mental processes as you are typing might be. It might give more kind of weight and permanence and authority to what you're typing, at least in your own mind. Yeah, on that point, there is a type. There is a piece of software that does that. Um, really? It's that actor guy, the one who was in Big, really, really famous one. What's his name? Thanks. Yes, Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks made a word processor that was like a typewriter, and it would do click click, and it's annoying as anything. But it's still <laughs> something to be continued look at. But in that particular thing, um, hi Carl. Just in the middle of talking about lots of things, including clicks for keyboards. As a tiny aside, over to you, Alan, because you were next. Okay. Well, speaking of haptic feedback, uh, I think this project open source project is really uh wild um let's see uh it's called smart knob and um it's it's an open source project so you can actually in theory make it yourself uh it's not he says it's not production ready but it's beautiful it's it's just a knob that you can place down and because it's uh controlled by a uh, bluetooth and a rotor um you can uh design whether you want it to be a button or whether you want it to have an arbitrary amount of uh, uh, sort of like uh, gravity points or notches, you know, along the way, or just totally smooth. And then you could use it throughout the day. You could imagine for uh, adjusting uh, any kind of setting, right? Like um, a simple one would be setting an alarm, right? But maybe you want to set uh, um, the... I don't know the 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 font height, the font uh, weight as you're going. Like this this idea of a knob being used uh, in addition to a keyboard is something that I love. But that's not what I raised my hand about earlier. I'll just say this really quick. Uh, so Rob, were you about to say something? Go for it. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, to what Fabian was saying earlier uh, about programming, there's a really great podcast called The Future of Coding. And I listen to it a lot. It's like the only podcast I listen to probably. Uh, and the two hosts um, recently, yes, what they do is they go over uh, seminal papers in uh, computer science and and read it out together and sort of break it apart um, and uh, uh, critique it. Um, and one of the delightful discoveries they had about themselves, and it was also just great to hear, is you know they obviously both love coding. They love programming. But one of them will 
uh, like automate anything at the drop of a hat. Like what they love to do is figure out how to automate a task. And that's, that's what they think of programming. You know, that's how they think of programming. The other one uh, hates doing that because that always breaks. There's always a condition where it isn't, it doesn't apply. So they are more than eager or whatever. They, they just, they go brute force first until, you know, there's absolutely like no other way to do it. And to have two entirely different views or approach ways of thinking about programming, two different personalities, I should say, but they both love programming. Um, it was really uh, wild. Um, and, and, and actually it was kind of like validating or it's the kind of message I would love to hear more often because I think a lot of people think, okay, if you're a programmer, it means you must have a, I'm going to assume your personality is like X, you know, you, you love looking at equations and equivalents, but, but I think Frode and I were probably of the similar stripe of like, there's, there's fascinating parts of programming uh, about the affordances that it gives you. And it's not necessarily about trying to um, automate a solution. It's almost like what, what did code overlook? Mm. I heard uh, great, on a, great podcast. Go ahead. On a podcast radio thing today, I heard an interview with Sadie Smith, who was all kinds of stuff. And she was talking about writing, not as a creative act, but as a controlling act. So I found that was very interesting. When you write something, it's a process of trying to cajole and control and have it in the right order. Uh, structuring. So of course, that relates a little bit to coding, doesn't it? Uh, you have to put in something cohesive to get something understood by a human or system. Yeah. So absolutely, there should be different ways. One of the things I want to do with my own coders is um, have the repository be accessible from my machine and spending a few more hours learning. Because there's so much of what I do as a designer is, yes, it does this, but can it do that? You know, it's a visual thing. And I think a lot of the, at least in the Mac programming environment, it's literally sliders and it's, you do the thing itself. So it, it doesn't change the logic of it because the logic will always break. I'm not too clever and I'm not clever enough for that. But anyway, fair enough. It isn't a one thing. Thanks for highlighting that. Rod, I'm going to have to try it when I get back. One uh, just riffing on that a little bit more. The one of the um, struggles that I'm trying to figure out how to communicate clearly because it's a difficult thing to talk about is that so much of how we interact today obviously is is based on mediation and based on computation, and computation is based on formal logic. A lot of that comes from the logical atomists of the 1920s and such. Uh, and, and, and it's this, it's this idea that, uh, as a default, our way of interacting is that X equals Y, or if X does not equal Y, we have to come up with a function to surround X so that it will equal Y, right? And this leads downstream to a kind of, uh, way of thinking that I think even shows itself in, in, a, in a simple, uh, uh, design pattern of like tags, right? Like. If you tag a bit of content with something, you're, you're, you're essentially signing a contract that says this bit of content equals this categorical, you know, tag or this file or this folder. And, and it's so natural that we don't question it, but of course, conversations have nothing like tags, you know, conversations don't have to, uh, fall into a line of thinking of this equals that you know, or this is, this is an alias for that. Um, hmm. I only mention it because I love, I know we, I talk about this every so often, but I'd love to chat about it more to really refine what the, to, to come up with a way of explaining it that is not as confusing as I just presented it. Okay. Leon, do you mind if I interject something? Thank you. This Sadie Smith thing, it was actually on Fresh Air. It was a podcast, I just remembered, uh, Terry Gross, American thing. Uh, another thing she talked about was women's freedom in the 1800s compared to now, because that's part of the theme of her book. 
And looking at freedoms, of course, of other groups than ourselves is very educational because it can also help us look at our own freedoms uh, and our own constraints. But what you talked about is, of course, women today are more free than in the 1800s. However, uh, language was developed to categorize. So before something is categorized, you have a different kind of freedom. Right. In our world, I would say we have intellectual freedom for VR, which is a current big thing because we haven't named the things in it. So at a certain point, and this is what I noticed at the Hypertext conference too, there was a lot of miss, not misnaming, missing of names. Uh, one example, and um, I think you were there, Rob, was the argument over invention. One of the mm -hmm. presenters said that, oh, forget the big inventors of history, Doug and Ted and so on. It can't um, happen without the society being ready for it. And they almost said, it's in the water, inventors don't mean anything. It's a cultural thing. And of course, I can't remember who said it, but Martin Luther King, if he was at a different time in a different place, he'd be lynched. You know, he wouldn't be able to do what he did, to put it in a very stark way. So that's the reason I'm bringing it up in this context is invention is, of course, many things. Our language for it is quite pathetic. You know, innovation is kind of gradual. We have invention, but invention has to be a process of some kind of genius moment in one or more people, but there has to be an environment through which that invention can happen. So if we yeah. are looking to foster invention for the future of text, we have to foster all those different elements that need to come together. And we don't have a, um... yeah, no, that, yeah, that's great stuff. But we don't have a, a good enough language for it. And I'm not saying we need more of a language because very often once you start making ontologies, of what different things is, it becomes so insanely navel gazing, it'll be a paper at Hypertext 24. That's only half a joke. Anyway, uh, Leon, please, over to you. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree. And I, what I, I, I feel exactly the same what Ellen is describing. I feel, um, well, not only that um, we're sort of really easily we get we get stuck in this categorization uh, mindset uh, and i also feel sometimes a bit that the jump from plain text to uh, for example html was a bit of uh, throwing the 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 baby uh, away with the bathwater because we're suddenly if you have plain text you can make connections which are a bit vague like maybe this is related to that and then the meaning of and, and the intensity of the connection lies with, with the author still. So somebody would ask like, well, uh, what, what about this case? What about that case? But the moment you're going to do a hard connection, you, you write something in HTML like this is that, or you have to really formalize it. It becomes really hard, sort of. And, and then it's, you're surrendering sort of the the uh, links to the machine and and that's where uh, you know people get really like uh, let's say a nitpicky and like hey but this is what about this and you get into a completely different space so yeah I, I definitely feel that um, a loss of uh, well a, a different a more restricted way of innovating the moment you you let go of the mm -hmm. sort of flexible connections yeah that's absolutely wonderful um, Alan. Oh well, yeah. I'll just I'll just add to that. Uh, um, like this, and I don't think this diminishes Tim Berners-Lee's uh, Tim Berners Lee's invention. Actually, I think it speaks to uh, how good of an inventor he is. That he wasn't trying. I don't in my in my uh, ver my fictional version of him. He wasn't trying to create a global solution. He was dealing with problems at CERN. He was dealing with academic texts and footnotes. And, and for that, HTML is, wow, you know, links are brilliant. And it is a brilliant situation, you know, it's a brilliant solution to that scope problem. But so often it's a, it's a wow, it is a thing that humans do without end uh, is we get an invention and then we immediately try and push it to its breaking point. And you could see it with like suburbs and you can see it with Slack, right? Where things within a context, if, you, if we were able to carry the invention and the context together, you know, then we might, uh, well, there is another world where we might've said, okay, HTML and, and the web is a great proof of concept for the kind of conditions that we want to have, but let's, let's take it piecemeal 
and see how it applies to different scenarios, right? And and you could also argue that already happened, like chat is an example of not sticking with, you know, hypertext between what you and I are saying, right? Maybe maybe it did become a different form factor, but yeah, so I agree. That's it. Does anybody else feel imprisoned by the freedom we have to communicate with each other in four or 500 different ways? Yes. TikTok, uh, you know, Instagram, chat, that there's just too many of them. I was yeah, trying to go back to Rome the other day, yesterday, and we tried, I think, five or six different uh, methods, Zoom, FaceTime, and we ended up only Google chat or whatever it's called worked. That's too many. It's not freedom. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree for a second. I don't agree at all. Not for not for a moment. And um, by the way, there's a Tim Berners Lee thing that's coming up. That's that's the hand. But no, um, it was actually Hanna, uh, our one of our nice guides um, in Hypertext, Rob, who uh, helped me get over that thinking. Um, because I had thought so that there is too much, and I was wondering for quite a long time when it would settle down and we had would have one way to message each other. Uh, but then she showed me two things. There's something, I don't even know what it's called, something the kids use. She's 24, uh, a number to remember because of the song. Just showing where they are. Like, here's a picture of where I am now. So all the friends show that. Oh, my God, there's an old man in the room. Come here and say hi. It's Hello. Is that a mustache? Yeah, he's grown a mustache in just one day of school. He just took it off. <laughs> so, yeah, when she showed me this, just a new way of doing, um, not something I'd be interested in, but, you know, you show your dinner, you show your view, you show your whatever, but it's so focused for that. It became clearer because a strange thing about Instagram, they're growing quite well as a company, but they're not growing in the sharing pictures or the stories, but they're growing for the chat. So it really seems that um, the younger generations are very comfortable with feeling this is how I communicate with this group of people. You know, it becomes very, very different things. And so I, I think that um, that may change. We've never in history had this many opportunities, but also, you know, so we haven't really adapted to it yet. Now, briefly on Tim Berners-Lee, uh, having met him twice, of course, I'm a world expert. Um, and my impression of him is twofold. Number one, he's a much bigger genius than we give him credit for. Uh, the web was the simple thing that came out. But I do think it comes down to what we talked about uh, with Fabian a short while ago. Very much of the, if we do this, then other similar thinking people will do good with it. You know, he's very naive in that way, like most of the great technologists. So not really taking into account all the rubbish that happened and hoping it will be used as just the beginning to make, you know, he said, very well quoted. He wasn't trying to make another TV. He was trying to make a, a way to think through. You know, we all know Doug Engelbart wanted to um, uh, just kickstart something. He didn't think he had the answer. And uh, Rob also, you Doug, says so wonderful that you're here in that angle as well, Rob. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that we're discussing here with the constraints of HTML, I think Tim would be the first person to say, yes, of course, these limitations. Now, how do we get past them? Fabian, you look like you're next. Yeah, just very briefly is when 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 you say, Rob, that we have so many ways, maybe too many ways to communicate. Yes, of course. Uh, but what what frustrates me is there are, is there are too many ways that are the same. It's like Google Meet versus whatever versus whatever Zoom and whatnot. They are like ninety nine percent the same, and I think that's such a waste. Like if I don't mind actually on my phone or computer having 50 different programs to communicate. Uh, ideally, I would prefer them through the browser, but why not? If each of them has like a genuine new way to communicate or a different way, and I think to me that's the big miss, uh, that if, if we can find ways, and I don't know like through dance or through hand waving, or I don't know what's the serious, but like annotating a live video, that's that's a discussion we had a couple of months ago. Like, should we have a live transcript? Can the transcript 
be summarized at the same times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like there are so many. I I feel that's that's what frustrates me. It's like how boring it still is. Like most of the tool we do use to communicate, I I really don't find. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, slightly higher video resolution or stuff like this. So I understand there might be like the lowest common denominator in order to have all the people that can be in this mode of communication. But yeah, my, my main worry with this is more of the same, basically. Uh, that, that's what I find like such a shame. Just briefly on that before I hand over to Peter. Um, I think what you said and what I say on this is wholly irrelevant because it is and it will continue to be. The only analogy I can think of is magazines. Magazines come in roughly the same shape, but you know the way magazines are put together compared wired with the Economist with the children's magazine, they're so different and it's still just ink on paper. So yes, I think we're going to see a lot of really rubbish communications tools that different subgroups will use for different reasons. Um, but it's something it, it's just it's just a reality and maybe hopefully we can contribute to making something that'll become more universal and more used. Uh, I share your frustration, but such as digital life, I don't know. Um, sorry, Peter. Yeah, I feel a bit overwhelmed by the number of conversations I'm trying to track in different locations. I really wish we had something that we could skin over all of those systems so that a software agent could be logging in to each one of the half dozen different chat platforms, integrate the output from all of them and provide it in, well, basically I'm thinking open doc now, an open doc framework so that if one company wants to do, you know, the really the ultimate in 3D bar charts and pie charts to be used in conjunction with chats, they could just build their ultimate 3D pie chart and bar chart component. And I could plug that component into my preferred user interface for annotating chats and I could mix and match. So I really wish the open doc people had come up with a better business model and plan instead of just leaving it to the marketers to blow up the technology because they didn't understand what its full potential was. And maybe someone can bootstrap that all over again. Yeah. Um, just replying to Hannah's message, uh, she was maybe thinking of joining us. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Th th this is a really important thing to try to keep it open. But let's remember that uh, the specific audiences want to keep things separate. You know, you don't necessarily want to use your parents' uh, messaging thing. You may not even necessarily want them to know it exists. Uh, but the openness that you're talking about it is really crucial. And this is why I scream up metadata at least once uh, every one of these. And that, that what you're talking about is openness and, and metadata as, as well. Uh, Robert, were you cleaning your screen or were you wanting to talk? Sorry, to me? Yeah. Uh, I did want to talk um, briefly. Um, I have people that I have to communicate to through WhatsApp. I have people I have to communicate through message, people I have to communicate through Skype. I have all these different, and I don't often remember which one I'm supposed to be using with who. So the idea of having some kind of organizer, and it was what I found at the beginning when you had uh, Kindle books, uh, Apple books, Barnes and Noble books, and I have books in all of those, and they are not in a common database. So I don't know what I have. I have to go look in each one in order to figure it out. It's just nuts. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is absolutely nuts. And, and I hate it too. I just think that we really have to stand up and accept, you know, as we talked about invention a few minutes ago, there are so many different forces. This is the commercial force. Yeah. You know, Kindle owning stuff. I mean, the Apple Books is really, really stupid. I wanted to publish the future of text in Apple Books. You have to do it from pages. I, and, and it's such a locked in thing. Even I just said no. I mean. Yeah. No, it, I, I do have a solution because I did that like 10 years ago. Uh, none of you is going to like it. It's just like I was having a conversation, let's say, like this. And, uh, and I would write it down on my personal wiki. Uh, I would keep, let's say, let's imagine I would have a, a private chat with a friend and I would have a page dedicated to that friend and uh, I would either put a summary, if it was of a chat, I would keep the log and, and do it. So it's, it's definitely, it's not a, a hard problem. 
and it was super useful, but not useful enough for me to keep on doing it 10 years down the line. It was like very powerful in the sense I had a conversation. Uh, sometimes I even had the uh, date time, so I know the precise moment or the first time we discussed about a topic with a friend. Uh, it, it just like so much work to the point that at some point, uh, using your own memory to synthesize what you believe matters is, yeah, <laughs> it's a, trust your own mind. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's definitely, again, it's, it's feasible. Uh, it's such a hassle. Um, I, I don't, I don't think it's a, like a big technical problem. And I think maybe also if we were, it's kind of also, it does piss me off that most of us are fine giving all our data to Google, uh, using Gmail or whatnot. Uh, and, and if, let's say, we were to have a conversation with a friend, like, do you mind if I log it? Do you mind if I like use transcription or record it? Most friends were like, I don't know, I'm not sure. They would not feel comfortable, I imagine. I didn't even ask, I, I could just do the test. Well, I'm pretty sure most of the conversation they would have, they would trust more Google than a friend, which is kind of, I don't know, does piss me off. But um, yeah, maybe I'll do the experiment and report back. I do that experiment all the time. And, and it's an Overton window that's changing. But uh, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, yeah there's like a law of irony. I mean, I was running the knowledge, the now defunct Federal Knowledge Management Working Group, KM.gov, and it fell apart because I couldn't get people. I, I, even other government employees would not create an account on the website. I literally had my email address on the homepage of km.gov. If you want to, if you want to help with content management, please send me an email. Never got, <laughs> it was just, it was crazy. And we were using, we were using Lotus Quick Place at the time, because that was the only tool I had available to me and stuff. So now I got all this content out there that I need to have a Quick Place 3 server set up so I can get content from <laughs> my board perfect. And so I guess, yeah, um, uh, ben Serp had a presentation he had done about the digital vellum. But, so there's all that content that's out there. Um, regarding the, the top, I'm not a, I haven't been, in, I was like one of the world's experts in, in um, Lotus 1, 2, 3 at functions and <laughs> macros and stuff um, way back. And I haven't really been doing much program. But one of the things I've noticed is, a lot of things seem to be able to export to JSON, but I don't really see stuff where people are importing uh, other importing that JSON into their plat into their platform. So I don't know enough about that um, about JSON and stuff, but it seems to me it's like the people. So maybe that would be. A, I mean, if you could aggregate those that JSON stuff, maybe. Just tossing that out, and then I'm gonna put a couple links in. My, uh, I work on I work on supporting em employees with disabilities, and there's actually a whole XR accessibility community out there. I found the guy who seems to be the community outreach is a guy um, Dylan Fox, and I've had an email with him. I've been trying to see like if. Um, engage them and like, do they have anything, little thing that they could contribute and could we get people to attend October 4th so that, um, you know, at least start making making that connection. The other link I'm putting to is they have an annual symposium. It was in June. I mean, when you look at it, I mean, this is incredibly comprehensive. So can our, it probably will be next summer, but, you know, can, can our um, future of text community be presenting there too to start making that connection because uh, the greatest technical challenge we have as far as I see is can people with disabilities engage in these virtual worlds or they're going to be completely excluded from it. And Carl, so, I'd love to chat more about that. I mean, I, I swear like uh, one of my old, um, one of my uh, uh, co-workers uh, last year or two years ago had a brain aneurysm and, and is paralyzed on one side and has basically can only move a thumb. And so we chat, which is wild that we can chat, you know, that she can text using voice and then text and get sent to me. And so we chat back and forth. I'm, I'm trying to figure out solutions to make her life 
you know, getting one getting around the house, but also like digital life. So I'd love to chat more about this and 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 find out what the standards are or what yeah, the um, where are you located? New York. New York and stuff. Yeah, there's a in fact actually there's a well there's an M enabling conference on that's unfortunately um gonna be like um I I'll have to check and see. I think it's gonna be a conflict with October 4th. Um and things but um the big the cal state university northridge is the one that's had historically had a big assistive technology conference and and things there'll be some of the people at this um that'll be here in dc um and things but yeah there's it's in a it's an amazing group i mean that's that's how i i mean i was supporting him i was in, in supporting people back at the department of education in the nineties. And it was like, sis, I need to, human computer interactions and a systems approach and human, you know, the computer supported cooperative work <laughs> and a crazy term and all these different things. And everything I was looking at in the early nineties went back to like late seventies. And then all these different areas, there was this 1962 DC Engelbart. Oh, it was like, okay, I found the source. So that's um, been about 30 years ago. And I guess my, I'm working on my PhD in the capability, looking at unleashing latent capabilities. So, I mean, it does get back to Doug's, um, the, in the, when you, the hierarchy of capabilities and then um, that you can unleash, you know, the latency that's as we, some of the newer some of the things so that's um an area there but um yeah and then the other thing i'm working on is trying to i mean i'm part of dozens of groups and almost all of them are exactly like exactly like this all white men <laughs> um yeah. and then and then the age um 50 is the new 30 i mean i'm i'm born in 64 so I'm like, there might be people five years younger than me and stuff, but there's like, so they're gen, the like gen X and gen Z do not talk to uh, gen X and, and time is relentless. Generation alpha is beginning kindergarten this year and stuff. I mean, so, I mean, we do, it's just, re, it's relentless and we got to find a way to, to um, bridge that yeah too that so um yeah. it's yeah uh, so i've always been looking at the really um big system the the human the human system side of doug's work is always where i've been so, yeah i'm gonna have to go and I, but i do want to try to engage more so it's 11 a.m on mondays 11 eastern then and, and it's pretty much every Thank monday Please drop those references or resources. Uh, I'd love to follow up oh, yeah. and, and get more information from you. Um, I think it's really, uh, you know, that was a, a great segue because I think it loops actually right back around to Rob's point about so many silos for communication. I think the the for me, typically, historically, the, the innovations that I've been most excited about that seem to have the longest uh, half-life are ones mm -hmm. that start out as accessibility-based, right? Like, screenshots uh um copy and paste uh so, you know the iphone did a really good job of trying to meet accessibility needs and now we're finding that some of those things that were designed with accessibility needs are coming into the mainstream that we actually the the you know more people are preferring those uh options uh and even live text in photos right which which goes back down to screenshots those are the kinds of silo busting forms of communication that that are only communications on the back end. They don't intentionally seem like a social media channel, right? But why not? They could be, or they, you know, they could be repurposed or something like that. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, like I that. believe, but yeah. yeah, I mean, just one of the things that's been so frustrating is it's like, uh, yeah, I have a friend who just has railed on IBM for years with their Artifice. maximizing shareholder value and stuff. It's all about market share now. And it's like, whoever gets their first, even if it's total fucking crap. Let me pick up, stay here. 
it, they 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 latch on and we can't get i mean i mean all these monopolies i mean microsoft office was the worst office suite there was back in the mid 90s but they leveraged their windows monopoly to force that on everybody and we've had the, that's been going on. I mean, in fact, I railed at the semantic web conference that we need to get back to Doug and Ted Nelson's vision and for the web and, and stuff. The only response I got was from, from uh, Howard Rheingold inviting me to his, uh, his community and stuff. And, and I got a back a response because uh, I CC Doug and Ted, I got a response back from Ted five minutes later and he was like, the chasm between the paradigms is so vast, I'm not sure where to begin the conversation. <laughs> We've talked quite a bit about this um, at, at Hypertext, not in yeah. the comments, but outside. Yeah, um, I really do have to go. I got a big meeting. Okay, up. see you later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, see you. Um, nice to meet you. Thank you. We, we, we talked, uh, there was quite a lot of, um, because of Dini Grigar, there, there are more women in the community than normal. She is not a person she's a force of nature but she brought in the electronic literature side of things so that made the balance much much better so one of the continuing discussions was around um, getting different people part of the systems and part of the conversation and it's the discussion that started mostly about women which is an important issue there are many things that categorically keeps women from going into computer science and so on and then we got into other issues, uh, you know, different mentalities and so on. It, it is really, really important. And also, I think we should remember what Randall said many months ago. Uh, we talk about people who, are, who have issues, physical issues or mental, as be, having only handicaps. But they also, some of them have superpowers, like some of the autistic friends. They have very specific abilities. And uh, here is Brandel. Good timing. I was just quoting you, Brandel. Um, we were just talking a little bit about, um, uh, Carl was there talking about disabilities and people with disabilities coming into these environments, both to use and work and live, but also to be part of the dialogue. Um, so while acknowledging that and acknowledging an ongoing discussion at uh, the Hypertext conference last week about the importance of getting women, um, different um, brains, different cultures into the discussion, into computer science and into our discussion, I was just quoting how you said that some disabilities also come with superpowers and uh, that should be part of the discussion. You know, like some people on the spectrum that have specific abilities. So I'm also wondering if we should maybe think more about how to, you know, one of the questions for um, the book and questions that I raised at Hypertext was, what will our bodies become in VR? Right. It really goes down to accessibility. Accessibility shouldn't just be about how do you put on a headset and control the damn thing. It should be about a whole package of how we interact and live in these richer environments. And um, sorry, I wrote myself a note much further down in this conversation. And that is also what I found a bit frustrating with uh, the hypertext conferences. There was some building, but there wasn't very much talk about building. And when people present, look what we did, it's usually very closed off system. Uh, which wasn't very encouraging. It's like, oh, okay, you did that. Does it do this? Does it do that next? So um, anyway, in terms of our community, Brandel, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about the HTML stuff, but Alan has got his hand up. Oh yeah, I'll just be quick. I mean, uh, the on the on the note of the accessibility and why I was, why I get excited about that is I remember being on a train the first time I heard someone behind me speaking and then saying next line and i was just like what was that why did, why was someone talking and they said next line and so i you know like surreptitiously sort of looked over and it was someone who was blind who was speaking into their phone or device and and that was you know being processed and so like it was for me an immediate like this is a whole different way to think about language to think about sounds you know and it's already being put to this use uh, that they were breaking out of, here's the thing that I'm saying, and now breaking out with, with no friction at all into a meta layer of a, essentially a function, you know, saying perform this action and then dropping back down into their narrative. 
uh, it blew my mind and it was so exciting. And that's the kind of invent that's an example of the sort of inventions that I think are, you know, do humanity good. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I forgot that's the other. We, and now we're Wait. benefiting from it too. We're speaking into these guys, which works insanely well. So, Randall, hello. Rob, are you going to say something? Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, did, uh, Rob. If you raised your hand, I didn't see it. Uh, did you? No, I was, I was waving. I, I was, yeah, I was enthusiastic. <laughs> okay. I was just being enthusiastic. Good. We'll forgive you. Well, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, another thing that I say about uh, about sort of um, perspectives is that it's simply useful to have people with slightly different problems that they are interested in solving and and are sort of um, conscious of as a consequence of their day-to-day -day lives. The reality of having a monoculture is uh, sort of being in exclusively in control of in control of uh, technology is that um, the the kinds of problem domains that they live in within uh, their days tend to dominate the solutions that are brought to bear against the world and it's really important for people to have different things they do and even woodworking is a different problem to programming and cooking is a different problem and all of those um, shades of intention and utility uh, and the subtle differences they bring, one, are important in and of themselves, but two, point to the absolute uh, sort of criticality of a multitude of viewpoints for being able to see technology as being for these different breadth of things. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's funny, like, because uh, inclusiveness and had people with problems like I don't mean it in the sense that people like but that that people need to be thinking about different things they need to be having different priorities and it's really wonderful to have people whose interest is not first and foremost front and center in hypertext or in AR VR or these other things uh, included as well because they've got they've got something to do and we we should help them so uh, nice to meet you Rob uh, thank you for joining it's um it, it's really quite interesting and i'm going to stop recording for a minute but the moral of the story that wasn't recorded is that to actually act on this diversity inclusion unless you're a proper company unless you are in a situation where you have access it's actually really hard and i would you know we are inviting people to the 4th of october for future update and the email will say, can you recommend someone? If you guys can think of someone or a network, please do. I mean, finally, we have a good amount of women on board. Not enough. And they're none here today. But for the monthly or other meetings, we have some amazing and involved women. How can we get a bigger brain for this or a larger Maybe, shape of our brain? I want to just throw a quick idea in there because I was just thinking about how this the same problem in the maker scene and uh, maker tech scene in New York, right? It's uh primarily white males right um and maybe some diversity there but not enough and uh, the thought i just had that i want to mention is like well to what degree is are the problems that are trying to be solved the kinds of problems that are interesting to a demographic versus the kinds of problems like you know what i mean like yeah. what what efforts are there to there to find problems that are outside of our uh comfort zone right like what what is that you know and, and the horrible example i could think of even though they had the best intentions would be the uh um hackathons the 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 government uh social hackathons that were like let's everybody get together take open data and and make some new app that's going to help people and nine times out of ten the app that was made over the course of a weekend would be here's a crime map that you can now you know pick a neighborhood and see the crime that's occurred over the some spectrum and it's like that Okay, that's you. You did good with the data that was available, but does that really help <laughs> uh, extend? You know, what you started up with does that help your uh, uh, make the world a more 
a level playing field. Well, I'll show you sure. not to walk late at night. Share a screen here. Um, this is our draft invitation to people who have been involved and news people. I think we should try to write in what you just said there. Good okay. idea. The hypertext thing, my presentation was, how can we ask better questions as, you know, that's what we do here. I think you're trying to set, not trying, that's a horrible way to say it. Uh, you're basically saying, what, hang on. How can we step outside of our comfort zone? Is that the part you're talking about? No. Ask question. Word. Go for it. Frodo looks frozen. Oh, um, I love the idea of the Groucho Club. Yeah, you should come. It's nice. Right, Brandel? Yes, it was lovely. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed uh, getting to it, and I, I look forward to coming again sometime. Um, I think, well, well Frodo sounds like he's unfrozen, uh, but I will take a run at it. It's that um, similar to the lack of inclusion is the lack of inclusive problems that that when you frame things as um, as being only for a, a certain like if you if you don't come up with use cases that are relatable then there's nothing to draw people from communities that find them unrelatable in to come up with better ones so meeting somebody meeting Sorry. somebody um, slightly closer to where they are concerned where, where they are interested is an important uh, imaginative exercise in a attracting yeah. people from a, a different community. Yeah. Yeah, we all saw your codes, Frode. That was hilarious. That's, funny, right? That's like a cheat code for anyone who winds up. <laughs> oh, boy. I have to run. No, don't walk. It's much safer. As always. All right. Look forward to. Oh, is it that? Oh my God, we're getting close to the. Um, I'm just moving this down. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure chatting, Rob, uh, and and pleasure everyone. To meet you. Pleasure yeah, to meet everybody. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to be here another two minutes to whoever can remain. So I'm just wondering for this email. Instead of community, should we just add a, this bit about what other people can you suggest? So maybe just do this. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I've got to go. See you next week, guys. Look forward, Peter. Likewise. I really missed it last week. Take care. Me too. Bye. Bye. Any thoughts on this, guys? I'm going to start to a bigger screen, is what I think. Bigger I'm on screen. a mini, so I'm having to blow it way up. Oh. Yeah, Brandel, Apple has this 27 inch thing that's just, we don't need VR with this, you know. I have been told. So let's see. Let me just have uh, yeah, I mean, Wait a minute, 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific? I think that's wow. right. That's 9 to 5 UK time. Sorry, we have to do it daytime to have a venue. Not, not ideal. Yeah. Well, coming in toward the end. Yeah, you can wake up for it, hopefully. It, the thing is, though, I do think um, these sessions can often be good enough. But, you know, the, the actual symposium is really good to meet in person. So I'm hoping that can happen more. Brandel, are you um, buying your own ticket? Or are you getting Apple? Or what's happening? No, unfortunately, I am um, too roped into some stuff that's too close to that time to be able to make that trip over. I have um, I have a presentation to the public on 
the spatial webs. Thankfully, it's exciting to do, but uh, on the 11th, and so I, I have, I, I will be deep, deep into all of the rehearsals that um, that Apple requires us to do if we ever speak off the well, apparently off the cuff on on anything. Um, but you know, it it comes with the advantages of having been adequately prepared. But yeah, so um, I will, I I should be able to make it to all of it, I think. But uh, I I won't be able to hop a plane to do it. Yeah, that sucks. Oh well, you came last year, and I'm sure we can do something again. Uh, plus, I may have to come to California to buy the headset when it's available. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you can you can go just as far as New York, but if you want, if you want to make the whole whole uh, pilgrimage over, then I'm sure that that people will uh, make it worth your while. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would, I would love to come see you. Guys. I was looking into it to to come to London and to save my pennies. Yeah, no, that would be good. That would be good. Um, also, briefly, um, the hang on. I'll, actually, I think we're we're almost done, so I'm just going to stop recording. Uh, we were just talking about the. Um, the display in the Roman Forum and how these little paper things do a really good job. Everything that I could buy for iPhone, iPad, every, all the guidebooks, they're all really bad because they're pro not properly hypertextual, meaning you read about a emperor and then you read about an emperor. Same person, but two different names. Some of them have five or six names. You know, that's not connected. The fact that all the main buildings was a temple. I mean, a museum today is called a museum because it's the Temple of the Muses, hence museum. So you read about the Temple of Venus or whatever, it turns out it's the treasury. <laughs> but, so these connections are really, really bad. I'm trying to write it up now in author in a kind of a linked way. But to do that with an AR headset, we can kind of zoom, you know, sorry, fade in and out the environment would be really, really powerful uh, presentation because not only would you be able to fade in and out the 3D buildings, which is a lot of work that tech, you know, philosophically trivial, you could do the same thing with the knowledge. You could be able to do, you know, a swiping of a timeline. You know, I want to see it earlier. Uh, other things, um, events, you know, maybe out of the ground, you can see events that happened. One of the things is Caesar got murdered over there. We know where it is. It's only recently been made available to the public again. Go there and see that. And then you get fun things like um, you don't want to bump into people. So let's say you're in full VR mode. Of course, even stones would have to be modeled so you don't you know, trip. But what if a person comes into your field of view? Maybe they should be rendered wearing a toga, right? So they're still there. You can see their faces. But there are so many things that can be done, both in the actual space and the more theoretical space. So, Brendel, you may want to think about that from a marketing point of view. Oh, final thing to say. I, I believe that if this was done by a proper group of people in an open way where the metadata systems, not just the metadata, but the metadata systems are open and available, it would be relatively trivial for any group to do any other location in the world. So we kind of kickstart that kind of stuff. Pause. I agree. I, I think uh, the ability to relate information to other information, to overlay, to be able to manipulate, uh, they're all essential components of what uh, what these, informa these pieces of information are. Um, I still think that the concept of the web is an important way of presenting and sort of coordinating that information. Um, but the idea of a web page perhaps is is uh represents challenges in terms of the mapping there so uh, i think that there's a lot to play with and a lot to get through um we just had a really great uh, session talking about the html model element which was very basic but uh but really uh i think some of the first actual progress that i got from google and meta uh, microsoft wasn't there for some reason uh, are about um, what this could be for, or or what are the basic handles that can make it be for something. So uh, I, I feel really optimistic about it, but also conscious, based on the level of abstraction of that conversation to the one that you're talking about, the forum, 
uh, <laughs> there's a long way to go. <laughs> there is a long way to go. But first of all, uh, I agree with everything you said. Um, I think web pages are it's fine. The reason for that is I've been fighting for PDF for so long, as you know. And there's the whole the whole point of PDF was printing to. It used to be paper. Now it's to a frozen format. It's the printing to right. So that's why I think that's fine for that world. For HTML, the notion of a page, you know, paging Dr. So-and-so, right? Even the word itself is quite arbitrary. So to have a, a, a set of layerings of pages, to try to squeeze as much out of the web as possible for this kind of thing, I have no problems with that. You know, even, um, yeah, I, I, I just think that it is really, really important that we do this. And also, what happens when you leave the forum and you go home? The whole forum should fit on your desk, right? It's such a great case study. And then you should be able to link it to other things. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about in this community for the last year and a half, two years, is the forum. I would be happy to work on it because I live right down the road. It's less than two hours flying. And it's just, it is a limited place. It is approachable. It is real. The current information presentation is awful. And um, imagine if we did it with a distributed team where, um, by distributed, I mean that if we're talking about the metadata and the metadata infrastructure handling, it has to go via that. Otherwise, we're going to end up cheating without even realizing. One thing I found out yesterday was I took the entire hypertext conference proceedings, generated visual meta for it, and it stopped working where we have ligatures because two Fs is not the same as a ligature F, right? So th that kind of stuff is what we would find out. So anyway, Brandel, if there's someone um, you have who's doing this kind of stuff, uh, do not hesitate to put us in touch for over six. Any last comments for the recording?